Hey, y'all. Welcome back to Mountain Murders Offbeat. I'm Heather. And I'm Dylan. Yes, you are. Yeah. <laughs> I can tell you're feeling very good today. It's like damn sunshine. Yeah, well, you're only going to get about four hours of sunshine, so you better soak it up. That sunshine got me feeling whoa. Boy. Yeah, yo. Got you feeling whoa? Yeah, like Black Rob said back in the day. Whoa, okay. Or I was thinking Joey from Blossom. Whoa. Yeah, no, I'm not thinking Joey from Blossom. Okay, well, Dylan, I have an interesting bit of history with some spooky stuff peppered in. Are you ready? We're going to be talking about the Stanley Hotel. Oh, my gosh. Do you know much about the Stanley Hotel? Well, it's the iconic hotel that was the uh, the scene or where The Shining was filmed. We're going to get into that. Okay. Okay. Thanks for that uh, what, spoiler alert. <laughs> That's all I know about the Stanley Hotel, bro. Freeland Oscar Stanley was one of the wealthiest and most famous Americans during the early 20th century. The man was a renowned inventor, a successful entrepreneur, an architect, and a hotelier. Ooh. His production of art stationaries made millions of dollars during that time, and he, with his twin brother, created the company known as the Motor Carriage Company. Their automobile company produced some of the most powerful and fastest vehicles on earth in the 1910s. So this is early on when uh, not everyone had a car, right? There was probably no power steering and the fastest they went was probably like 10 miles an hour. Yeah, but that was that was moving fast. <laughs> that was get, getting somewhere, huh? Yeah. When Freeland received news of his tuberculosis, he became distraught. There was so much in store for him in the future, and it seemed like this tuberculosis was already threatening to take it all away. Get out of here, TB. I mean, consumption or tuberculosis was a big deal back then. It well, afflicted a lot of people. Yeah, was it contagious? I believe so. And, and so it was like a, a kind of a slow burn disease that slowly just destroyed your lungs, basically, right? From what I understand... <clears throat> think you had like wheezing and coughing that kind of thing and then you carry like a really um ornate embroidered handkerchief a kerchief and you like cough blood in it but then you must say something really profound after you look at the blood on the kerchief like i'm your huckleberry yeah like that his doctor only recommended that freeland get enough fresh air and sunlight from natural spaces you don't really have any cure for consumption no, so it, it's basically moved to a dry, arid place, right? Yeah, a lot of people moved out west, uh, especially the southwest, you know, places like Arizona, New Mexico, Southern California. It was, it was like the, the, what do we call that, the, the great consumption migration? So, uh, you know, I always thought consumption was about drinking alcohol, you so did? It, it was t- it's tied to tuberculosis. Well, people called it the consumption. Oh, because or... it consumes you. <sighs> yes, Dylan. Okay. He was also asked to put his things in order since he could be dead before the end of summer that year that he was diagnosed. I mean, that's pretty scary. Hey, you've got this disease and you might be dead in six months. Yeah, so basically um, you've just found out you're really sick and uh, you possibly could be dead inside of a matter of months. And then, like, all your plans for the future, your hopes and dreams, everything's kind of, boom, just gone, turned to ashes. Crumbling, yes. After surveying a list of choice locations, the man and his wife decided to visit and explore the Rocky Mountains area. He left his home a weak man on the verge of death with a promise from the doctor that his body would be picked from Colorado after his death. Okay. So we'll come get your body. That's a great way to start out a vacation. Yeah. Right? I mean, this is kind of like, eh, not a great story to starting out. After you die, we'll swing back and grab you, swing by and grab your remains. A month after their arrival, Freeland's wife discovered that her husband now was beginning to look healthier and more robust. Something about his health was promising. He had this increased um, kind of uh, hope that, you know, he definitely hadn't had before they moved there. The couple had now fallen madly in love with the ambiance of the Rocky Mountains, hiking around the place for miles each day. It seemed like Estes Park, where they settled, was giving them a new lease on life. 
She had no idea that her husband would remain with her at Estes Park for four more years. In fact, he would later outlive her by dying at 91, just a year after her death. Damn, so as soon as he moves out there, he starts feeling better, basically, yes. right? Yeah, he's got, I mean, Colorado, you've got the mountains, the fresh air, serene, nature, pristine. So, yeah, who who wouldn't feel better <laughs> <Damn>. <laughs> living in a place like that? I want to go to Colorado right now. I do, too. We have some listeners in Colorado. We do. We should uh, go. We should take a trip, Dylan. Four years after setting foot in Colorado in 1903, the couple returned home to resume their lives since the miracle at Colorado seemed to prolong Freeland's life. Upon returning home, they discovered that they weren't comfortable with their past lives, with all the hustle and bustle that came with it. Estes Park had taught them serenity, beauty, and an appreciation of nature. Their old lives offered none of that. For this reason, they decided to return to Colorado and build a hotel to accommodate visitors who wanted to experience the beautiful natural settings of the park. The construction of the resort began in 1907 and was completed in 1909. The building came with a hydraulic electric plant located somewhere in the mountain area to provide electricity. Visitors who arrived at the location by train were shuttled by a set of steam-powered vehicles known as the Mountain Wagons. Damn, this dude's got loot. Yeah. The main building consisted of the concert hall, manager's cottage, the gatehouse, and the lodge. So this is a very striking building, the hotel itself from the front. I mean, it's very uh, kind of got that gothic, you know, architecture mix in there, don't you think? Um, I don't know if I'd call it gothic. It, I mean, it seems more of that turn of the century style. I mean, to me, it kind of almost looks like a big expanding plantation house or something. And it's white. It's got the big columns. I'll post some photos. I think I was thinking of another building. You probably are. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. So by the 1970s, the hotel had become a ghost of its former self with dilapidated rooms and a poorly maintained environment, if you will. Some say its managers were considering a close down to use the building for something completely different. There were stories about Freeland's ghost being spotted in the hotel's billiard room and bar. Sometimes hotel guests claim to have seen it at the reception stand. It is believed that even after his death, the man still wouldn't leave the hotel. He liked it so much. Freeland's wife was also spotted numerous times in the concert hall. She would tickle the piano keys Ooh, ding 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 yeah ding. How, i like old tickly goes how haunting is that to just hear like the clang of like piano key i don't know that would be creepy that would freak me out yeah these weird creepy tales traveled far and wide and would-be visitors decided to stay away from the stanley hotel with the reduced patronage came a fallen income and resources to maintain the building so it's just like a vicious cycle the so, less people come, the less money they have, the more it falls into disrepair. And the creepier it seems, which makes even less people come. Yes. Ooh. <laughs> I kind of want to go visit the place in the It's summer. like an old prostitute with no hands, making less people come. No? Okay. I knew a one-armed prostitute. Did you really? In Norfolk. Wow. She lived across the street from me. <clears throat> Okay. And I know, well, everyone knew she was a work, <laughs> so, everybody knew she was a working girl. And she has every right to be. But she did have one arm. And we had this other neighbor named Willie who lived down the way. And um, they were caught fucking in his uh, town car. Damn. Yeah. Not having sexual relations. They were all out. They were like in the, like in the street having sex in this like residential like neighborhood. It was like a cul-de-sac. <laughs> right. <laughs> It was, yeah. Uh, mommy, what's that man and woman doing in that car? They this was like 2010-ish. They're wrestling, son. Just keep there. moving. Yeah. It's yeah. A true, true story. Around this time, author Stephen King was battling with the plot for his new book, The Stand. He was desperately in search of a location that would inspire him and help complete the story. Some friends told him about the haunting at Stanley Hotel and asked him if he'd ever given it a try. So, of course... The curious Mr. King was on it. His visit would not only produce a best-selling book, but it would also cause a turnaround in the destiny of the hotel. 
So he's looking for a nice, quiet, inspirational place to finish writing his book. You know what? Like, I've always dreamed of being a writer. That's like all I ever wanted to do as a kid. It's like all I've ever wanted to do. And I just think, what a luxury to be able to go someplace that's nice and private, secluded, where you could write a novel and have that free time to dedicate every day to writing without the distractions. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I think you would thrive in that environment. How awesome would that be? Yeah. I'd be so productive. If we get 100,000 patrons, honey, I will, I will send you somewhere like that. You will? Yeah. Our patrons would send me somewhere like that. Our patrons we have now are special. They are. <laughs> Stephen King and his wife visited the hotel in the fall of 1974. Upon arrival, the couple was told that the hotel would be closing soon for winter, which meant that only a few of the staff were left behind to attend to them, and they would be the only guests spending the night there. They were served dinner in an empty hall with all the tables except theirs bearing, like, the overturned chairs. Like, the place is totally, like, packed up. See, this would be a very um, creepy kind of environment, don't you think? Yeah, definitely. You have this, you know, these big, large rooms and like the rec room or ballroom areas, and this place meant to house many people, but yet there's no one there. And, and so everything's packed up. You know you know what's creepy to me? though, And this must be what rich people do, but when the house is uh, like uh, packed up for the season and they cover everything with sheets and stuff, that 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 is creepy to me. It is. Yeah. And I think that's what rich people do because I've never known anybody that had a bunch of extra sheets. We had to use the sheets every day. Yeah, we need a new sh- set of sheets, actually, Dylan. <laughs> they have furniture sheets. <laughs> They're only like those big canvas drop cloths. Or yeah, whatever. and I'm sure it's to keep dust, uh, you know, off of all the, you know, the fine furniture and antiques. And the beautiful antique wingback trails. Yes, and, and have you have to, and then you have some little old lady and man that go in there and like get everything ready for you before you arrive. Yeah, you imagine living like that. Man. I wouldn't want, and I wouldn't want to live like that. It's too much. It is too much. I don't. Uh, want, I don't want a big house because even if I had a lot of money, I'd be thinking about things like heating it and having all these rooms and like, would you just close them off? And then I would feel guilty having staff to like clean my house and shit. Like I should be doing that. So I don't know, and I don't want to dust all that. So. Well, no, and, and sometimes when I'm at my laziest, I can barely walk from one end of our tiny house to the other to get to the kitchen, and I can only imagine if my master quarters was on, you know, like in the west wing, and then the galley and the kitchen, or I'm on a boat now, and the galley is over here on the east wing, and you got to walk way over there to get stuff. You would never survive on the naval ship, Dylan. Oh, my God. Too many stairwells and... Yeah, I never make it on the belly button boat. (laughs) So after dinner, the guests returned to their room, which happened to be room 217, for the night's rest. Later that evening, Stephen King left his wife in the room to walk around and explore the hotel while listening to music. wonder if he had on his his Beats headphones. Honestly, I've got to admit, I did not know that King actually went and stayed at the Stanley Hotel to work on a book. And in this setting, which is basically like the movie and book that he, he wrote. Well, Dylan, this is why we have a podcast. Oh, my gosh. To inform the uninformed, <laughs> right? Wow. Yeah, baby. Stuff it in my ear. Stephen would later describe the eerie feels he had that night while walking through the hotel's corridors. He claimed that he had seen some weird things and heard strange noises coming from various rooms as he passed their doors. That night, after retreating to the bed, Stephen King had one of the most disturbing dreams of his life. In it, he saw his three-year-old son uh, darting, (laughs) I will get that out, past the hotel corridors being chased by a fire hose. Okay. The boy was screaming and calling for help from his parents, but none could provide any help. The scenario was so traumatizing that Stephen King was jerked out of his sleep due to the shock of seeing his son so helpless in this dream. I know what that feels like. Have you ever had those dreams? I mean, I feel like I have those dreams quite a bit where you're so shaken. It's like you you do like jerk awake and then you're like scared for a couple of minutes and it takes you uh, a little adjustment period to figure out that it's a dream and it didn't actually happen. Well, yeah. And once you do realize it was a dream, you're you're um, you're relieved because it was so scary or so horrible. He was actually really close to falling off the bed. 
when he finally realized himself, that's when he got out of bed, sat on a chair, lit a cigarette, and started looking out the window. Did a big line of coke. That experience would kick off the idea for the masterpiece we know today as The Shining. That's wild. And only in some, and I think uh, Stephen King is one of the best writers of our time. Don't Do you agree? Yeah, I mean some of his later stuff. Well, no, I know I'm ta- his early work. Was I'm talking pretty fucking good. Uh, and I know there's some King fans out there right now who are die hard, and, and no matter what book comes out, they get it. But I'm talking the uh, uh, the earlier stuff. The OG King. The o- OG King. You can't touch it. I mean, it's well, just there's nothing else like it. No, and and it's all because I mean, he. I feel like in some ways he created like modern horror. Yes. Yes, and I, and I was a huge King and Dean Koontz fan, and I uh, couldn't get enough of either either of those yeah, guys. I Dean Koontz, I read and, some of his stuff. When yeah, I was some it's of good. his some of his stuff. I think it's, I'm not going to say better than King's, but right there, kind of with you know the only other person that kind of made me feel the way Stephen King did when I'm reading one of his books, and uh, yeah, I think he actually helped create. Um, I don't know; it doesn't seem to be as much of that nowadays. I don't know; it's just different. Maybe and it also I think it has to do when at what point in your life do you read the books, the way you interpret it and makes you feel, you know you can't recreate how you are when you're twenty something reading a book. Right, I'm not going to speak for all of our readers out there, but I feel like most of us, at least the people I know who are like avid readers or into books, bookworms, um, started reading Stephen King fairly young when we were in our tweens or teens. Right, and it really kind of like developed our taste for horror, the creepy stories, you know, anticipating this very, like, I guess, elevating your anxiety, what's going to happen next kind of thing, you know, in these books and, and really kind of developed our taste for that. Yeah. And uh, that's a shout out to Stephanie, one of our discord fam. She's a, a, a voracious reader. Yeah. She has a book club and everything. And, and I think she maybe uh, knows a lot more about the modern day, Compared to, you know, the older stuff. I don't read as much as I used to. Another author that rivals King is Jack Ketchum. And he was uh, published around the same period. You know, I mean, that's kind of when he rose to fame. Would have been in the late 70s, early 80s. And he has some pretty fucked up horror books. Really? Yeah. I got to read more. You do? Gosh, I used to rip through books, man. Yeah, sometimes I like Audible. Yeah, but you know what? I think reading it off the page... Is like just better for your brain. It is. Than and I do have Kindle it. and I read a lot of books on the Kindle, but there's just something about holding the book and smelling the book. Yes. Filling the book. Yes. Caressing the paper. The, the dog eared pages. Yeah. The yellowing around the outside of the spine. Yeah. Or in and the for pages. me, I feel like nothing's better than buying a, like a secondhand book. That's the only way I to love get them. The used books. That's the only way to get them. They're, they feel slightly weathered and. Oh. Yeah. There's no telling what this book's been witnessed to. Okay, back to our oh, story here, Dylan. Gosh, I'm off and, mm. The yeah. Shining success caused a surge in interest for the hotel. Its design and history formed the basis for the fictional Overlook Hotel described in the novel. Tourism became the primary source of income for the hotel as they welcomed more guests who simply wanted to see the place that had inspired King's story. The 1980 film adaptation by Stanley Kubrick, starring Jack Nicholson and Shelley Duvall, even increase the public's interest in the hotel's history. Really? I, I find with horror folks, The Shining is one of those films that people either like really love it or they hate it. Or they're like, it's not, it's not that great. And, and I think that's uh, directly linked to Kubrick. Because honestly, you either are head over heels for Kubrick and everything Kubrick, like my uncle, for instance. <clears throat> I'm a big Kubrick fan. Or you don't get it. You don't get what he's doing, and because he has a certain style that just goes to through all his movies, no matter which one it is or what it's about. And, and I don't know all all the Kubrick stuff. A total auteur filmmaker. But I think, uh, yeah, I think I think that's where he his leans toward people who realize how he's arranging these shots, what he means to uh, the information he he intends to exactly to uh, convey, even subliminally or set a mood. And I think he's a master of all that, and I don't know, you know, all the the terms for that stuff. You've we've talked about it some. You've schooled me a little bit, because I'll just be like, 
what the fuck are, well, what's the big deal about this? And you'll, you'll break a scene down like, oh, and I'll be like, and when I know all that stuff, then I have more appreciation for what they're doing and what I'm seeing. When I was in college, I minored in film studies. Yeah, they know, Heather. At, well, I wrote a lot of paper. Like, when we would do papers for classes and stuff, I, I, I did write a lot of papers on Kubrick because I, I, I thought he was amazing. And um, Lolita is a film I remember writing, like, an extensive paper about Lolita. Um, but I think Kubrick was a, I mean, he's a fucking master. Master he, craftsman he was. when it comes to filmmaking. And I love The Shining. I think it's fucking terrifying. I, I think it is, and I think it's some of the greatest, um, one of the greatest uh, roles Jack Nicholson ever did. Oh man, he fucking made I mean, that movie. There's no, like, there's no way I no could. No one else could be. Yeah, I couldn't imagine anyone else in that role. Johnny. And let alone <laughs> being directed by Kubrick. I mean, it's like a, it's like a damn uh, superstar, you know, situation or all star. I mean, it just doesn't get better. A young Nicholson and a Kubrick. Shelly Duvall? Shelly Duvall. I mean, but famously terrorized the entire time by Kubrick, which is very strange, but seems like something he would do just to keep her in a constant state of hyper awareness and like fear. You know, uh, Hitchcock was famous for tormenting his actresses as well. Yes, Hitchcock's a very interesting person. He had a, yeah. Yeah. We should do an episode <laughs> on Hitchcock. Uh, we can. Oh, my God. Okay, so back to our story. We've uh, we've uh, gotten off subject here. So apart from Stanley Freeman and his wife, other ghosts are believed to haunt the different floors of the building. Many of them are the ghosts of visitors who so love the hotel and its views that they returned every year to enjoy you know, the uh, the presence of this uh, building and whatever. After their deaths, uh, their ghosts lingered in the hotel, occupying dark spaces and sharing certain rooms with unexpecting visitors. For this reason, the hotel has been nicknamed the Disneyland for ghosts. <laughs> okay. It has welcomed several paranormal investigation teams into its building, majorly people who want to experience things for themselves. Fortunately, the ghosts that occupy these walls are believed to be uh, benevolent ones who won't harm a person, but will go on with their normal activities without care. So it's like they're doing their own thing. And so you... I guess like the residual energy yeah. ghosts. Like so you might just see them like, you know, making an omelet or something. They're not poltergeists. Yeah, they're not menacing. It's kind of how they were trading the shining. Well, I mean, I know there was menacing elements, but the rest of the... Stuff that they would see was like they're still having the grand ball oh, or, right, yeah. you know, having parties Bartender. and yeah, yeah, just doing their normal thing. All right. There have been some reports of ghostly appearances in almost every room of the Stanley Hotel. Their manis uh, manifest, I can't, I can't talk today. Their manifestations range from flickering lights and ringing sounds from the walls to guest items being shifted from one place to another. The hotel employees will not hesitate to tell you how much the ghosts hate the sound of vacuum cleaners. Really? Many of the people who haunt the hotel lived before the, uh, you know, the invention of vacuum cleaners. So the advent of its strange technology still seems to baffle them. Plus, the loud sucking sound may be spooking them a little bit, too. Some cleaning staff will tell you that they can tell a ghost is in a room and it wants to be left alone when they plug in their vacuum cleaners to the wall socket and some unseen force unplugs it. Ooh. Okay, that would like, freak me out. fuck your vacuum cleaner. <laughs> Damn your vacuum cleaner. Yeah, Rick James's ghost is there like, fuck your vacuum, and it's like unplugging it and he's like kicking it and shit. Uh, so that would freak me out if I was doing that. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, Absolutely. I don't care who you are. So, Dylan, let's talk about some of the most haunted spots in the Stanley Hotel. Now, if you remember, Stephen King stayed in room 217. And room 217 is reported to be one of the most haunted in the entire establishment. After the success of King's novel, the room also became the most requested in the hotel it has a long and scary history that precedes King's visit. The story happened sometime in 1911 when the hotel was still powered by gaslighting. Oh, okay. So my mom was there. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh -huh. no, there was a severe storm one night. The head chamber maid at the hotel, her name was Elizabeth Wilson. She was lighting the acetylene lanterns. Uh, it's acetylene. I'm sorry. That's okay. 
I'm not smart. It's fine. You know, <laughs> you, you over there in the, in the halls of education with the books, and I'm out here. What's acetylene? See, uh, I don't even know. It's like a gas, bro. I don't no. see. Now you're going to make me look stupid, but oh, I know well, it's acetylene. Okay, well, I Acetylene don't torch. We can both look stupid. I mean, you look stupid. I look stupid. It's fine. We're stupid. I sound really smart, though. <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a gas. Look, I have a big brain. I don't know everything though. Hence the gaslighting. Yeah. See. So okay. This uh, acetylene. <laughs> Gosh, is this, is this gas Asian? What the hell are you talking about? Uh, so the acetylene, as you said, Dylan, lanterns in room two seventeen. When an explosion blasted her body through the floor and down into the dining room, which was located just underneath. Oh my God! I know. Luckily for her, she survived with only a broken ankle. Talk How in the a hell? Fucking miracle! She's right? blown through the floor. Yes, but legend has it that the woman hasn't left her former place of employment. Her spirit remains within its walls, performing some of her former housekeeping duties. Okay. And fucking unplugging the vacuum cleaner because she don't like that shit. Yeah, I'm not trying to hear that. Guests at the hotel have reported their items packed, flickering lights in the corridor, and dusted surfaces even when no housekeeper had come in to do the work. Well, I like this ghost. <laughs> no, I wish our ghost would. <laughs> You're going to pack my bags for me and clean up? We got a ghost in our house, and he doesn't fucking clean. He Babe, just makes noises. The ghost made brunch. It's really yeah, good. I wish. You, need to... you hear that ghost? He likes to hang out in our podcast room. Don't mess with him. Not... He needs to fucking do some housework. Ask gas or grass ghost. Ain't nobody ride for free. Okay. What are you, home. a 1970s bumper sticker? Yeah, I've got a mullet and everything. What? It's true. She really does. So I'm thinking maybe I'll come home and the ghost will just have like rolled me a nice blunt. Ooh. <laughs> right? Hey, I'm getting on board <laughs> with this ghost. Historians of Stanley Hotel have described Mrs. Wilson as an old-fashioned lady who won't tolerate any intimate relationship between unmarried people at the hotel. Damn. She don't want you fucking. Yo, bitty. Hey, she's she's a moral woman. She is known to taunt such couples whenever they come around by climbing into a shared bed and pushing them apart until they become frustrated and stop their shenanigans. Well, it's gonna it's gonna be beyond frustrated. I, Boning's gonna be the last thing on my mind when some unseen force is forcing us apart. A ghostly housekeeper is cock blocking. Yeah. Okay. I was about, honey, we'll have to do this later. You know me, I would be freaked out, and that'd be the end of it. <laughs> Anything weird, and it's over. Yeah. Uh, you're like um, the flight of the Concords, like business time. The conditions have to be perfect. Yes. yes. It's business. As long as the conditions are perfect. Damn. <laughs> Apart from Stephen King, another prominent celebrity was Jim Carrey. Really? The actor who had a strange experience in room 217. The story appeared in The Atlantic about Jim Carrey during the filming of Dumb and Dumber, which, by the way, is a fucking hilarious movie. Like, I still love that movie. Jim had checked into room 217 at Stanley Hotel, and he checked out about three hours later, never returning. Nobody has a full idea of the event that transpired behind closed doors, all that is known is that Jim Carrey's humorous outlook on life couldn't stop him from witnessing the supernatural. Some other crew members producing the said movie also had weird paranormal encounters at the hotel. So they're filming the movie Dumb and Dumber, which apparently is in that area. Yes. And they're staying at the San Stanley Hotel, crew and cast. Yes. Okay, but Jim checked in, He's but like then he checked the out, fuck out. And he decided to stay somewhere else, yes. obviously. Wow. <laughs> Whole righty then. Yeah, I know, right? Okay. Okay, so let's talk about how the Stanley Hotel was an inspiration for another Stephen King novel. Uh-uh. Yes, Dylan. Which one? Stephen King's visit to Stanley Hotel brought lots of blessings, including The Shining, but that wasn't his only book inspired by his stay there. The idea for another of his horror novels also started to form just after the visit. This would end up as Pet Cemetery. Wow. On the hotel grounds lies a pet cemetery hidden just off the side of the building. This was where pets belonging to former hotel managers and staff were buried. Some of the animals' graves on this ground pay tribute to several pets like Cassie, Elsie, and Comanche. Cassie is a golden retriever that sometimes roams the compound at night. So we got some ghost dogs on the property. Man. Her distant barks fill the night air. This happens even though no one is in the building um, owning a dog. 
Comanche is a brown and white fluffy cat that roams around the property. She can be seen sitting close to the window panes watching the hotel inhabitants as they, you know, offload their boxes, packages, luggage. That sounds like a very cat thing to do. (laughs) Stare down (laughs) upon you and judge you. Yes. In 2019, when managers of Stanley Hotel decided to dig up the graves and move the animal remains to another part of the compound, a local dog psychic... What the fuck is a local dog psychic? (laughs) Okay, so this woman calls herself a dog psychic. Her name is Rosemary MacArthur. Warned that the activity could lead to more than strange um, things in the hotel. Yeah, dude, you can't mess with the remains of these animals. Leave them alone. She was sure that the animals would be happy with the disturbance and that they would show their displeasure by causing construction delays and bursting pipes. Rosemary MacArthur suggested employing the help of a psychic so that the animals could make the much-needed transition. Oh, a psychic like herself? Yes. Oh, man, it's kind of like when Al Gore was like, oh, oh God, the climate's going to blow up. But then he just happens to have bought all this company or created a company that makes carbon credits. And then he's like selling carbon credits, probably the best way to get big business on board with this. And then he got wealthy. (sighs) And he created the Internet. We created the internet. The hotelier built the concert hall in Stanley Hotel as a gift to his aging wife. She loved to go in there alone and play the piano, sometimes deep into the night. Many decades after her death, people have witnessed her in that hall playing her favorite instrument. Who? Another popular ghost that hangs around the concert hall is Paul. (laughs) Paul? Just Paul. Just Paul the ghost? Before his death, Paul used to be the caretaker of the concert hall. And he enforced the 11 p.m. curfew in the hotel. This may explain why some guests would hear someone yelling at them to get out anytime they enter the hall late at night. That is Paul's ghost keeping up with his curfew enforcement duties. One uh, construction worker who came for some repairs in the concert hall reported that he had heard someone uh, yelling at him and also nudge his shoulders. And it made him so uncomfortable that he had to get out of the place. Yeah, I mean, if I feel... <laughs> I don't want a ghost to berate me. No, man, don't be putting your hand, your ethereal hands on me, dude. Don't be shouting at me. It seemed like Paul was uncomfortable with this man's presence. Tour groups have also experienced Paul's services in which he flickers lights on and off at request. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay, seems like a pretty good place to do a ghost tour. Yeah, and from their website, I, it seems like they do offer... Ghost tours. I'm sure they do. Yeah. The last ghost of the concert hall goes by the name Lucy. Lucy used to be a homeless woman in Colorado who found Stanley Hotel and decided to take refuge in it. It is believed that Paul and Mrs. Stanley saw her and decided to help out by giving her some small jobs around the property. Anytime she was less busy, Lucy would come into the concert hall and sit in a chair to kind of, you know, have a moment or so before um, returning to work. So she just go have a quiet minute in the concert hall. After her death, the ghost found a new job of entertaining ghost hunters around the hotel. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Let's talk about the fourth floor. And not just like a room, but the whole fourth floor. The whole four, fourth floor. The whole fourth floor. Now, the Stanley Hotel contains two of the most haunted rooms in the building. Room 428 and room 401. But they say the entire fourth floor is haunted. These are just the the two rooms with the most activity. Guests ushered into rooms on this floor have reported hearing children giggle and chase each other down the corridor. A long time ago, the whole floor was specially furnished to accommodate children visiting the hotel with their parents. Mr. Stanley wanted a space where the kids could be um, attached to nannies who would take care of them. And this would relieve the parents of that stress for a while. Decades later, ghosts of the children have come back to occupy the place. These ghosts have a favorite playing spot, which is close to a closet. Guests have witnessed the closet's door opening, closing on its own accord. You know, ghosts... Child ghosts are scary. Well, I was going to say, they're scary. Yeah. We've, we've, We've talked about this before. Disembodied children chanting or giggling or saying some shit like, do you want to play? Our little toys. It's scary, bro. Going off. Oh, no. Yeah, I don't like I think they're ones. scarier than adult ghosts. They are. Like, for real, because I don't even trust kids. You know what I'm saying? Because <laughs> I'll just be like, like, giving them side eye, like, what are you up to? You know what I'm saying? Because I do all this shit for you. What do you do for me? Honestly. 
<laughs> no, really. Room 428 is known for the sound of footsteps and moving furniture. The real scare is the bloody cowboy standing at one corner of the bed who only a few visitors can see. Where the hell did the bloody cowboy come from? I don't want to see no bloody cowboy. No. I'm just going to put that out there. Some will go in and spend the night in that room, while others will leave horrified after witnessing the cowboy. Some believe that this is the ghost of a man named Jim Nugent, who used to guide visitors in the Rocky Mountains. His relationship with an explorer named Isabella Bird made him a famous ladies' man. He was shot dead by a rival. Years before the hotel's construction, many say that Jim would appear to female hikers and blow them a loving kiss before disappearing. So maybe he found a permanent sanctuary at the hotel after its completion in 1909. Okay. The Bloody Cowboy. Yeah. So that has been our tale of the Stanley Hotel. Well, I did not know most of that. Um, And uh, it's very interesting tales of the paranormal and creepy there even from its very beginning with uh, Mr. Stanley having been diagnosed with a TB and uh, told he was going to die and then they move out there fall in love with the place build this big hotel and he lives there for years before he does die I mean all that's pretty interesting yeah no it totally is I would love to visit the Stanley Hotel I had a friend who played on a uh, like an opposing roller derby team but you know we were buddies and she moved to Colorado a few years ago and visited the Stanley Hotel and pretty soon like after she got there had some weird experience and she was like oh hell no and like had to bolt she was like I'm not gonna fuck around with this place really yes wow yeah I okay. remember she like took to social media to be like, uh uh-uh. uh. <laughs> we were here like 10 minutes and I was like, fuck this and left. Yeah. So if any of y'all out there who hear this story have been to the Stanley Hotel, hit us up at Mountain Murders Podcast at gmail.com. Let us hear about your experience. We would love to hear. We would like about to read it. it. Yeah. We need to plan our trip to Colorado, Dylan. Oh my God. I've been wanting to go there for years. Yeah. It's, a, it's really beautiful. Yeah. I think you would like it. I got reefer, too. Well, there's that. <laughs> I've had them reefers. I don't want to go in the winter, though. Uh, you don't want to go skiing? No. In the Rockies? I haven't skied in, like, gosh, probably, like, 10, 12 years. You think we're too out of shape to do any of the stuff we used to do? Probably. I know you was like, oh, I got these skates. I'm about to go skating on the sidewalk. And you skated back around the block. You was like, oh, my God. I'm well, out of shape. Well, there's that. Plus skating the, sounds hard. Well, plus the boot comes up, like, really high. And, like, my derby boots are very low, like, below the ankle. And these come up kind of high on your, um, you know, like, above the ankle. Yeah. And those boots were fucking killing me, and they're really stiff. Ooh. Yeah. Stiff? They're, so out, if, they're outdoor skates. They're just not what yeah. I'm used to. So if anybody needs a pair of uh, high-quality skates that's been worn one time. <laughs> <Some> moxies. <laughs> I know where to get you a fucking you know pair at a good deal. I'm going to wear what? those skates. They're cute. I'm going to wear them. You're never going to wear them. That's not true. You know I like to hoard things. Leave me alone. <laughs> when did you wear them after that one time? Another time. You're a, did you really? Yeah, I did. Oh, my God. So they've been worn well, twice. Well, I think part of the problem is I don't really like the wheels that are on them either because they were like the factory <laughs> wheels, and I just need to get a better, like a set of roller bones or something. Oh, yeah. Plus, I'm on the sidewalk out here <laughs> where there's like leaves and pebbles and shit. So I'm like, nah, if I go to like the skate park with these on, I, I think it'd be a better experience. The Hazelwood sidewalks are pretty rough. <laughs> There might be like a, you might be like a bum laying across the damn sidewalk. Yeah. Or somebody's backpack and you trip over it. Don't judge me. At least I even tried to skate, Dylan. Yeah. What have you you tried to do? I watched you skate from the front porch. While you sitting and looking? I was having to sit. Dylan's exercise is sitting and looking. I was sitting and looking, thinking about stuff. Lifting up the beer can is your exercise. He's like, yeah, this is really working my forearms. Had my tall boy. You know, my physical activity comes in like um, compressed time frames where I'm very, very physical. Like spurts? for small amounts. You have spurts. Yeah, I was going to say spurt, but you know, it's one of those words. And, and so um, it, it, it's very intense. It comes in spurts. <laughs> wow. Okay. Thanks for that. But yeah, it's very intense when I am physical. So I really don't think I could do that all the time because I think it scares people. You honestly. know what? Don't judge me. You know what? Bitch, I went to the gym yesterday. Yeah? Yeah. You did? Yeah. Well? I'm going to go today. 
I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> when we wrap this up, I'm taking my ass to the gym. Oh, I did a 16 hour down day at work yesterday. I'm, I'm wore out. You are. Yeah, you, I just showed you uh, on the side of my fat where I got a, a raw spot from my belt because I've been working so hard. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> wants to hear about your raw spot. <laughs> well, hey, I, we keep we keeps it real here on Offbeat. Well, okay. Well, everybody don't has okay. got a raw spot, so there's it's... that. What the fuck, dude? <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm just saying, that's showing how hard I'm going, bro. I'm going to get you some antibiotic Cream, when bro. your clothes beat you up and leave marks on you, you're going hard, dude. You need a good ointment, Dylan. Okay, so that's been a great story. Thank you, Heather. Um, thank you, listeners. Uh, we love you as always, and we'll be back Sunday. <laughs>